Hi everyone, I'm Sean from Retirement Village Financial Advice. Um, we basically specialise in this very weird, complicated area of financial advice. And just before I get into this, the reason I do this is that I went through this with my own family. So my own grandparents, they, when they first came to Australia in 1967, they bought their family home, big four bedroom home. That was everything for them. It was more than just bricks. And then eventually, it, after a while, they eventually moved into a retirement village in Glen Waverley. And I know that even with all of my financial education, everything else, none of it really helped because it was a whole new world with all these different fees. And I went through this with them, navigating that minefield at the time for me in retirement village. And then both of them later went on to residential aged care. So then dealing with that part next under the old rules. And that was when I realized how little I knew about all of this. And that was when I started to, I guess, specialize in it and do it for myself. That was a number of years ago now. Um, and just a, a little bit about me when I'm not working. I'm actually outside of, I'm, I'm often doing things with the Army Reserves. I used to be a full timer, not anymore. Um, but just in terms of this area, I'm actually very connected to this area. I only live five minutes away. I'm on the school council for Old Orchard Primary. I'm the head OSKIC coordinator. So I, I love this Blackburn area. It was really handy, only a five minute drive for me. So, and what I do for fun, and get away from the kids. I'm, I'm often on that motorbike, which I think of as one of my best lifestyle decisions, not necessarily a good financial investment, but yeah, that's my form of fun. In terms of today, we've got a lot to cover. So when it comes to retirement villages, there's, there's a whole bunch of financial changes that get triggered off. And just in the, this is the first time in a number of years that we've actually seen a lot of changes. Now there's been changes to retirement finances you've probably seen with budgets and politicians have been messing around with superannuation for the last God knows how many years. And for the most part, they haven't been good changes for retirees. This is one of the, this is the first time I can remember in about, you know, over 10 years that we've actually got some positive changes that have come in. So when it comes, and some of these are very specific to people downsizing. So make sure, yeah, I ask lots of questions. And I guess a lot of the point of this is just to make sure that everyone's aware of a lot of these changes and how they apply to you. So these are the things that we will be covering today. Now, I guess the recent changes, can I just, Get a show of hands. How, how many people are aware of the downsize of contribution to superannuation? Okay. Yeah, about half. Yeah, that's really good. So we'll talk about, we'll, we'll go into that in a little bit more depth, some of the recent changes that have happened, and I guess why we do something like this. And we'll go into some of these other changes. Now, the first question before we go into what the downsize of contribution is, is why superannuation? And it's a fairly common question because especially if you haven't had super your whole working life, maybe some a little bit different to someone of my age, then sometimes it can, you can often wonder why. Now, the short answer is you get to hold on to more of your money. Now, with your own investments, there's tax planning now and there's tax planning later. Most people fit in their individual names. They'll pay ca um, tax or capital gains tax up to a maximum of about 47%. But where it becomes really relevant, uh, especially the conversation I have with retirees are, when you might not spend all of the money in your own lifetime, and it comes to maybe even some next generation planning. So that, if I put it really simply, it's that your kids get more money than the tax office does. And that's where things like superannuation can really come in. And the government knows this, that's why in, prior to these changes, they've made it more and more difficult to put money into superannuation. So effectively, in your own personal name, we've got those tax rates that can be quite high. And for most people, generally 60 or 65, once you're fully retired, the tax goes to 0%. So on, that, if on the same earnings, basically, more than half of it, well, depends on, the, on what we're talking about, but Effectively, you pay less tax. That's why superannuation. And in some ways, through beneficiaries, we can also get more control over it. But those are things that, if we have time for questions, we can, we can talk about. It. 
So prior to this, after the age of 65, it became very, very difficult, if not impossible, to get money into superannuation. You had to meet sometimes these complex work tests, which were just impossible to meet. And once you got to the age of 65, for the most part, you simply could not add anything more into superannuation. And one of the problems that a lot of people ha had when they downsized is that our, it was typically at the age of about 65 and over that maybe that four, three, four, five bedroom family home that was perfectly appropriate back then might not have been, might not have been as appropriate maintenance. So then when people downsized, then they had all this money and they went, great, what am I going to do with it? They couldn't put it into super. So some of these recent changes that have come in is that there's a few different types of superannuation contributions being able to put money in. Again, mostly, most people had to put this money in during the course of their working life and with mortgages, with normal commitments, it's often difficult to find that, I guess you could say spare cash to put it in to build up your super. Previously, it was limited to about the age of 65. Now, they, they've basically removed a lot of these restrictions up to the age of 74. Now, this has been a game changer. For me, I specialise in retirement planning advice. I actually used to be the financial planner at ANZ Forest Hill when I, was, when I worked at the bank. So a lot of my retirement clients are around here. As soon as these changes came in, I got on the phone to everyone. Every strategy that I had completely changed and said, great, now that we can do this, we are going to make some changes. So things like the bring forward. What that means is normally you had 110,000 you could contribute in any year. Uh, when you were under the age of 65, you could bring forward the next few years and contribute 330,000, but after 65, you couldn't. Now you can. So again, that's been an absolute game changer with any money sitting outside. Eligibility age for downsizer contributions. That, that was brought in a few years ago. I can't remember exactly when, but when, when that was brought in, Basically, that allowed you to put in $300,000 on top of any financial cap into superannuation. You had to be 65 and meet a whole bunch of conditions. They've now, just very recently, in the last few months, they've brought that back to the age of 60. So that can be amazing, even if it is just for, uh, for sometimes where I've seen that of a lot of benefit is where it might be a younger spouse who can now contribute their own 300000 So it's been quite a whole bunch of really good changes. The other stuff about working and the pension rates, I won't go into them too much, but effectively we've, had to, we've been allowed to pull less money out of superannuation, maintain more in that 0% tax environment. That happened last financial year, it's been extended for this one. It probably won't for the one after, but we'll see. My, my crystal ball's as good as yours. But if I can summarize this, it, over the last number of years of being a specialist retirement planner, I haven't come to my clients with good news. It's always been, all right, look, the latest budget's come in. They've just introduced, you know, the cap used to be 180, now it's 100. This used to happen, now it's this. There's not much we can do, unfortunately. This has been one of the first times, in fact, the first time that I've got on the phone and it's been all good news to people aged, I guess, that 65 to 75. I, for the first time, I guess the... Government has rewarded retirees, as, as they should. So that's where the downsizer contribution comes in too. One of the other things that came in was this downsizer contribution. Now, there's limits to how much you could put into superannuation ordinarily, and the downsizer contribution contributes on top of all of that. So even if there's these things called balance caps, basically, in a nutshell, the government said, we don't want people holding their entire wealth in this 0% tax superannuation. We're not making enough money off it. So what they did was they brought it down to a maximum of 1.6 million per person. This downsizer contribution can count on top of that. And by the way, I, I see some people taking notes, pictures. I'm going to share a copy of all of this afterwards. So with Pavilion, so yeah. But this has been absolutely amazing. I mean, look, we, we know what Melbourne house prices look like and we're, when a lot of people downsize, they find themselves with some leftover money. And, question, yeah, that's fine, question. Um, the 300,000 each, that means for half a 
household or husband and wife? That's 300,000 per person. So 600,000 oh, for, uh, for the couple. Husband and wife. Yeah. So are even the same property. Yeah, it's on, so this can only be used once with the downs. And, and this is where I'm sort of glossing over this. There are a whole bunch, like with anything tax office, there's a whole bunch of check boxes. It generally applies to your own property. And however, once you really delve into the legislation, like with anything, there's always exemptions and there's, there's some positives, there's some negatives, like with anything. But as a general rule that applies to most people, if, if it's your own family home of more than 10 years, you're eligible for this. Obviously, if, if you think you fall outside of these bounds in any way, seek, seek some advice, ask some questions, because like with anything, this is just the tip of the iceberg. But for the most part, most people who meet these can contribute. So these are the basic criteria here. Um, there are more, but basically within 90 days of the settlement, if it's your own home, you've, you've lived in it for more than 10 years, for the most part, if it's your own family home. You can put money, you can put $600,000 for a couple into superannuation. Now, some of the other good parts is that it doesn't actually have to be money from the sale proceeds. So, for argument's sake, it could be, you could, it could be a $300,000 apartment, let's say, that has been your own home. You might have downsized previously. You might, this might be your second downsize. Still opens up this same limit. It could have been money sitting around from a share portfolio that you've got. That's another really good strategy we've been using because, you know, what? why are we going to pay all this capital gains tax later down the track? Why don't we get it in the tax-free environment? Hold on to 100% of our franking credits and our dividends. That can be a strategy for some. The other thing that a lot of people aren't necessarily fully aware of is that with superannuation, most people build up their super using their employer contributions or salary sacrifice. They're the, they're the most common ones. That forms part of what they call a taxable component. Now that's fine if, it, if you use it after 65, it's tax-free. If it goes to your spouse, if you pass away, also tax-free. But if it goes to generally an adult child, they'll pay an immediate 17% tax on that. And it, it's, it's something that most people just aren't aware of because everyone just, in Australia, we don't have inheritance taxes like they do in the States and other places, however, a lot of outside the family home, I'd say superannuation is where most people hold their wealth. If you had a million dollars in superannuation, most of it, I guess, let's say all of it tax-free component, very common. If you pass away, the tax office will immediately get $170,000 before it hits, before your children get it. So there's, there's things that we can do just to plan for this early on when it comes to this. So there's a whole bunch of factors that come into play. Again, I guess most people, the goal is they, they love their kids more than they love the ATO. So, <laughs> so what can we do about that? And the good thing is also with this downsizer contribution, no age limit. I've done this for people in their 90s. Again, just for these similar type of reasons. So one of the things, I guess, is that that comes to superannual. So that when the money comes in, that's one of the best things you can do. A lot of people at that age, especially if the bulk of their home, is, a bulk of their wealth is concentrated in their family home, they might be full or part pensioners or get other type of benefits. And it will naturally have an impact on pension and other benefits. So just as a quick refresher, the full rate of age pension has just gone up recently. It's just more than $1,000 a fortnight that comes in for a single person. There's a bunch of different rates, but basically what happens is that Centrelink will look at all of your assets. The most common ones tend to be, you know, things like cash, shares, super. Um, there's no preferential treatment given at the moment to superannuation. There used to be certain rules around it. Those don't exist anymore. However, we're not going to be able to cover this in this meeting or in, in this seminar. But one of the other changes about two years ago, there's been a retirement income covenant where, again, we've seen some changes to how retirement income is treated, where we've seen things that can give you things like 60% Centrelink exemptions. Now, they haven't existed until, I mean, when I went through uni, maybe 05, 06, I learned about all of those. They, they got rid of those around that time. Some of those things are back in vogue now. The rules have been changed. There's been some massive good changes that have been very positive for people receiving Centrelink. So it's just, it's really important that we just ask the right questions and we make sure 
we've got the right thing for your circumstances. The other things they look at are things like employment income. They tend to look at one or the other, but it tends to be, and the family home is completely exempt. Now, one of the questions is with the retirement village is does it count as a family home? For the most part, yes. If it's more than $216,000, yes. This is your new family home. And I'm not sure how many people read the comments in the age, but basically by putting more into the family home, by changing fee structures and what we do, we can actually get ourselves a lot more, more of a boost when it comes to Centrelink. Generally speaking, every, every 100,000 less in accessible assets results in an extra $7,800 in extra age pension year on year. And typically most, and I'll, I'll go into when, when typically most people tend to spend their money too. Even if I just pause for one second, any questions on the Centrelink age pension? The most common question that I do get is, well, how much money can I have in the bank before the pension goes away? Now, for most people, if I get out of the way of being a homeowner, it basically for a couple, up to 400, this is just the assets as an income test. This tends to be the most common one for most people. For a couple, up to 419,000, then it gradually reduces up to the point of 935,000, and that's when it cuts off. These will change every three months, so th these are the current rules as it stands right now. Perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to more flash this up on the screen, and just so people can, I mean, I'm, I'm going to share a copy of this presentation, but as a financial advisor who specialises in this, these are the most common strategies to reduce Centrelink accessible assets. Some of these can be really good. The big one that I'd really talk about in this situation is, I guess, that explore different retirement village contract options because I can have two people see me looking at the exact same price. Let's just say they're two different apartments here that are next door with the same price, same contract options. I'll probably give, if two people see me with differing financial circumstances, I'll probably give them two different answers about how they should structure it. And that's where things like retirement village contract, it becomes really important, looking at everything holistically, not just the retirement village in isolation, but how it affects everything else. Generally speaking, as a rule, the more you put, the more your family home is, I mean, because the family home's exempt, the more you put into it and the less you hold outside, the more pension you get, as a general rule, but it's not everything. And one of the other very common things that we get is just want to touch on the difference between these two cards because when you've got the pen, when you're receiving just one dollar worth of age pension, it was a lot of what I spent my time around here doing, just getting people just under that threshold using all my tricks, just so they'd get just a little bit of age pension, even if it was twenty dollars. The reason being they'd get this pension a concession card, which was basically worth its weight in gold. So there's thousands and thousands just right there from all the benefits you get, rates, rego, healthcare. Now, a very common scenario when people downsize, sometimes their assets go above the allowable limits. It happens. When that happens, sometimes, like a lot of people, it goes into the too hard basket because Centrelink won't offer this to you. They'll just cut off your, if your assets are above, they'll just cut off your pension, no questions asked. They'll leave it at that. There's Commonwealth Seniors Health Card. For self-funded retirees, basically it allows, it gives you a lot of the health benefits that, and cheaper medication and there's a whole bunch of different benefits that you get that has a different set of rules to the age pension that most people I talk to are eligible for. This has been the other huge, huge benefit and again I've had to, or I've been fortunate enough to be able to call a bunch of people who I have as clients who Previously, as a couple, if your taxable income was over $92,000 and there are some rules around how they assess super and everything else, you weren't eligible. Again, one of these changes that has been really positive, now it's over $144,000. They've just increased that threshold by 50%. Everything has been gradually getting tighter and tighter. Last few years, things like pension thresholds, I don't know if anyone remembers the 2017 changes, where the age pension eligibility went down significantly. They've done the exact opposite now. They've actually increased it by 50%. So I've had a whole bunch of other clients now who 
were previously ineligible and now they have been eligible. So it's been a bit of a game changer there. The important part is just making sure that we don't miss it. That if you're eligible for it, you've paid enough tax dollars over your years of working and everything else that we make use of everything that you're entitled to. Yeah, prescriptions become significant for, I've noticed, especially when it comes to some of my older, more, I guess some of my aged care clients with health issues, it has just been an absolute game changer. It's probably worth tens of thousands in some cases. So one of the things that, you know, these are just from my number of years as a retirement planner, these are the most common fears that I come across. First one is running out of money. Um, that's that permission to enjoy, especially I know that fear can come from when you're working, you've got a constant source of income, but then when you've built it all up, there can be some, I guess, some hesitation in spending that money because most people, they don't want to run out and it makes sense. And it's just having that permission to enjoy that lifetime of hard work, knowing that you can basically spend the money in essence without thinking, crap, 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 can I actually afford this if you're on a holiday rather than soak in the sights and take it all in. Another big one is wanting to leave assets to their family. And look, I understand that, especially we've seen what's happened with property prices, wanting to help children generally. Absolutely understand wanting to do that and balancing the two. Maximizing entitlements, there's just so much out there. And as you can probably tell, it continually changes. So the person who might have gone to Centrelink let's just say 12 months ago, they would have been, they might have gone in and asked them, can I get a Commonwealth Seniors Health Card? And they would have been told no, and it would have been correct. 12 months later, unless you really keep your finger on the pulse with every budget change, which let's face it, most people don't, then often a lot of these entitlements are just, it's just money left on the table. And another big one is getting the care that you need at the right time. Now, a lot of people aren't aware. I mean, there's, Everyone's aware of nursing homes, aged care facilities, and then and there's at home. So if I look at a zero to 10 on a scale, on that continuum, most people think of it as there's the zero, there's the 10. Well, I don't need to go into a nursing home. I don't need this. I probably can't get anything. Uh, we're gonna go into some of them, but basically there's, there's also anywhere from a one to nine here. And that's where making sure that we get all of that is super important. Yeah, time. But th I think all of these, they really go hand in hand. No none of these can be just looked at in isolation. So by looking at what we've got, what, what we're entitled to, and just being able to make the most of the best years of your life. And I'll talk about why I think, I think everyone here, I think most of us are in the best year, or most of you, not me. And I'll talk about why it's, it's because of this. It's this trifecta. Now, with these are the three, I, I think of these three three parts that money most people in their 60s tend to have more money than they've had growing uh, throughout most parts of their life now when you're younger you would have had a mortgage you would have had kids and expenses everything else that comes in after you've retired you've probably got access to your super and for most people even downsizing the home this tends to be in the best position that they've been in time again when you're when you're younger, you're, you're running around so many things, whether it's family or career, or even sometimes caring for parents, whatever it is, time tends to be the thing that most people don't have. I can speak for myself as someone in my mid to late 30s, look, you know, running around after three kids. Time is not something I have that much of at the moment. Um, and same with health. And I guess this is one of those things that, yep, whilst you might have been health, a little bit healthier in your 20s, most people were, this is as healthy as you'll ever be. And this, and this is the absolute time where I f I, if we look at all three of these in, in, um, in combination, this is where that time, health and money are at their absolute peak. So this is the time to go enjoy it, make the most of these things. And I'll talk, and I'll talk about why too. It's because if you, most people, I mean, you've probably been on things like retirement calculators and listen to things and they typically have an approach like this where it's just a constant, this is what you'll spend. You look at these retirement standards, you will spend $55,000 in retirement, this, that, the other. 
That's not how it works. In practice, this is how it works. And it's not necessarily linked to age either. What I find is this phase one, this is where you, tip, where you see people doing that typical grey nomad stuff, traveling, going out for dinners, you know, with their glasses of wine, caravanning, and that happens in that phase one. Now this depends on, for some people, this can go to the age of 65. Now I, what I'm seeing more of is that 75 to 80 kind of time frame, where with good health, time, money, those carefree years without any major disabilities, things are just fun, things are great. And that, I think, is the part that we absolutely have to maximise because that's when, this is that prime opportunity, time, health, money, to go do all of those things because you're not going to get the time back. Is what I very often see with my clients, and I've just been on this journey with so many of them where I've seen them go through that, retire, um, and then go do all the fun stuff, and then the quiet years tend to kick in. That might be around the 75, 80, all of a sudden, they've gone and done all their traveling. They've done their Europe trips. They've gone, you know, they've done the lap of Australia, whatever it is. Everyone's got something different. And then it tends to be a little bit more of a quieter existence. Sticking around the house, you're still fine. It probably needs a little bit of care. And what I find is that that's the time that most people don't actually spend that much money. Even people who have, you know, like quite a lot of money, they, what I find is that even a single person might, or a couple might spend the amount of the age pension because they're probably not going and doing all the things that they used to. And that's when things like a social community become really important, your family, your friends, like-minded people, because that's where you'll be spending most of your time, not going off to Italy for, you know, six months. And then once we get to the frailty years, that's when I find, not to put too fine a point on it, but all the money in the world doesn't really make any difference. For someone in there, I'd say, generally speaking, with severe disability where they need a high level of care, I've got clients in nursing homes, I've got certain ones, you know, to sad cases where they're early onset dementia, where this has kicked in in their, I guess, early 70s. Other people in their mid to late 80s, they could win the $50 million Powerball and it would have absolutely no impact on their life. Um, unfortunately, once the health goes, there's, there's not really much else. The, the time and money don't really mean as much is what I find. So that's why what I encourage people to do, and I'll, I'll give you a real example. I had a, had a client who he, I've been working with him for a number of years. He started work at the age of 15, built up quite a lot of money, heaps of money. Uh, money wasn't an issue for him. He'd never bought a brand new car, too afraid to travel. He, he, and it was a result of his upbringing, he told me that, but it was once it took a little while to convince him to buy a new Land Cruiser and a caravan to do it. Um, they're currently touring Australia, but it was just showing them that, look, even if we do this, this is the impact it'll have on your finances. You're still going to leave your kids this much. It's just you've gone from in 20 years leaving them this to like this, which is a fraction. Do it. And if you don't do it, you're not going to enjoy it and they're absolutely loving it. So for him, I think he's now 69, thereabouts. So he's relatively young still. So, no, he's a bit early. I'm sorry, he's 71. But, they're, but for them, they're, that's the time to go and do this phase one. So I guess that's where things like retirement communities and villages come in. Um, I believe in this just because I, I'm recommend, like I, I recommended for my own grandparents that they go into that. And even for my parents now who are in their late 60s, that's what we are currently looking into this because the big one is that a lot of people find is maintenance. That when it comes to the family home, there's all sorts of stuff that needs to be done, especially if it's an older home, just the standard maintenance and getting up on ladders, whatever it is, uh, that it's just, it, it stops becoming as appealing. And especially if you've got all these bedrooms that really aren't being used most of the time. And it might kind of go into maintenance, but part of it is even if you are doing a bit of traveling, that if you're heading off overseas for three months, it's a hell of a lot easier to be in a retirement community, like a retirement apartment like this, and just be able to just lock the door, tell the manager and just go, um, as opposed to all of the stuff that comes in, have someone check your mail, whatever it is in a normal home. During COVID, I saw the social part became super, super important. Now, most people in normal family homes, I, talk, I think about myself in this situation, my parents' home, my grandparents' old home, 
communities aren't what they used to be. Most people, they just see a garage door go up, garage door go down. They don't necessarily even know their neighbours' names or anything else, and it became really, really isolating um, during COVID times. I, my anecdotal, non-clinical opinion is that even people with dementia, I think that that worsened significantly during the lockdowns due to the lack of social um, just interaction that people were having. That wasn't the case. People living in retirement communities, you are, I mean, I think back to, this happened to me when I was in my army days. I was full time for six years. So I, I lived in a barracks with a whole bunch of my peers. I'd eat with them, I'd live with them. We were our own standalone community. That, when I left the army, that doesn't appeal, that doesn't, sorry, it doesn't apply to me anymore. But this is one of the huge benefits that I've seen in recent years, just having that community of like-minded people, not having partying people in an Airbnb or whatever it is, Sports and interest. I know my grandparents did. This, this was huge for them. Um, most retirement communities have got a whole bunch of interests that they do. You can, whether that's a U3A, the bus that takes you to certain places, and just having it all internally built in has just been great from a lifestyle perspective. And I'm going to talk a bit about care needs. It, it's really high on priorities for me, doing aged care planning and just having talked through all of this. Uh, uh, and helping so many other people, including my own family. Because there's, but when it comes to it, these are just, I mean, you can just, just have a read of them, but these are some of the reasons why I think they're a great idea that even whilst technically possible um, outside to organize yourself probably doesn't happen as much. And it's a lot easier when it's just on your doorstep. Let's see for time. I'm, These are the main, this is the list I've put together just from my own thinking. Now I've got nothing to do with any particular retirement village, but I guess just having to look at it, that these are what I see as the main pros and sometimes the main cons, especially, I mean, the pros I've talked a lot about. Um, the cons, a lot of people just aren't necessarily used to living in a retirement community or even that, not quite apartment, but a smaller style of living. Just on this, I might even pause here for a second, just even for my own purposes. Is there anything that anyone would add from a pro or con perspective, or if we've got someone living in one or knows someone? If I've missed anything, I'd, I'll add to it. For, yeah? Why do you say loss of independence on the cons? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. For some people, it can be things like in an apartment style of living especially, maybe not as much in this style, but whereas if you go some of the ones closer to the city, it's it, for a lot of people, that can be a little bit, a, a lot of the communal things, a lot, a lot of things are managed, whereas they've got care services that are offered, and it's a bit more of a structured type of place to be in. Now, there's different continuums, and where independently people might have operated a certain way, and they just feel a bit claustrophobic, only when compared to their own family home where they can do anything they want. I, I dare say in a place like this, and I, you know, just, you'd probably find it's closer to having your own family home. You have to keep your voice up. Oh, sorry, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, well, I, I dare say uh, a village like this is a very different proposition to somewhere, like as an example, there's apartments in the city near Carlton and whatnot, which function more like apartments and more service. They're great options for a lot of people, but you might say that there's maybe a slight less bit of independence, whereas a place like this, the way I see it is, and where my grandparents were in Glen Waverley, they were very similar in terms of, you've got nice facilities and it is very much like living in your own home. So I'm not sure you would experience that as much here. Oh, absolutely. And, and this is where there, there is no one size fits all for retirement villages too. Um, whereas there might be, yeah, there, there's the, the same village. It, again, it can be a great, great village, but there's, as an example, I'll give you, there, there's other brand names that are more like aged care facilities, that they are technically retirement villages that offer high care all built in. And for someone in their 80s or someone going in, absolute perfect option for someone like that, or in their late 80s with high care needs. Um, whether someone like that, this probably might not be the best option for someone like that. 
And so it's just the, the right choice. Whereas if someone, a 65, 70 year old on the other hand, I t I'm not sure I'd recommend that they go to one of those facilities at all. I'd say maybe check out somewhere with a little bit more space. Do you like your gardens? Do you like the lake? Do you maybe have a look at here? If you've got family nearby, um, then th th yeah. So there are definitely other considerations. Anything? Do we have anyone who lives in a retirement community here by any chance? In current residents? Okay, but, but yeah, in a nutshell, th these are the ones that I've picked up over the, just I guess over the years, and I guess a lot of it, we'll see if we go questions, but the contracts are just so complicated, and, and the, but that, the complications can actually bring some advantages too. So that, those are, or, or what I'd say, opportunities if you know what you're doing with them. Yeah? In the pros column, you talk about can free up cash flow to enjoy life. Yep. Does that mean it's going to cost me less to live in a retirement village than it costs me <coughs> in my own home? That all depends. Generally not. Where, where I talk about that is, let's just say most people live in a family home that's worth X dollars. They typically, once they downsize, they free up some money. And then they're able to then, instead of having that all tied up in their family home, they're able to use that um, to enjoy. In terms of the ongoing costs, what, what I think, what, the way I explain it to most people is that, if, you know, like every retirement village has their own ongoing costs, definitely. But you're also getting the services for it that you probably wouldn't get in your family home. If you had a gardener who came in, you had cleaning services built in, you might have a swimming pool that's cleaned and everything, everything maintained for you. That's part of where the ongoing costs come in. But one thing I will say is that the retirement village contracts, the way they're done, and this is as someone who doesn't work for one, is that the village doesn't actually make any profit off that. That's just covering their costs. And you'll find they're generally fairly locked in, so the earlier you can lock in that ongoing service fee, the better. Um, so you might find after a little while, the services that you're getting, uh, if you had to pay for that, if you had to organize that all yourself, all of those same services in your own family, family home, you probably wouldn't have that same scale to do so. So yeah, if, a bit of a reach, but I think you might find that it potentially is cheaper. So this is where I'm going to sort of gloss over this just so I can answer, open up to more questions with this. But what I wanted to really talk about here is that in a retirement village, what we find is that a lot of people... What do you mean by it? That's not what I mean by it. But it, there's, a, there's all sorts of care options that are available. So basically it starts with that regional assessment service. Now most people in their early 70s, I'd recommend get a RAS assessment. It's done by My Age Care. It's done by the local council that provides some basic services that you just get cheaper. You might get a cleaner uh, gardener, or you wouldn't need a gardener, but you'll get certain services that are highly subsidised, often at $10 an hour, whatever it is, um, and just to make sure we use that. And then what a lot of people don't realise is that there's these home care packages. And they can help with all sorts of things, and it graduates with their needs. There's a whole bunch of things that are on offer, but in a nutshell, it's anywhere from 13000 a year up to close to $60,000 a year provided by the government in home care. It's not asset tested, it's income tested. And the thing that drives me absolutely crazy is that most people don't even know this thing exists or how to access it. Um, and retirement villages in particular are set up for these home care packages. They've often got a provider on site, one they've got a relationship with. I can tell you right now, in, if you had a suburban home, there's gen, it, at the moment there's about a two year wait due to a lack of carers to get any kind of home care, it tends to be a lot easier to increase in a retirement village because there's probably a home care provider. They might even be the home care provider already providing these services. And again, $60,000, uh, uh, you know, roughly per person is a huge amount that we can gradually keep making use of, even if we go from a one, two, three, four. Now, it's really important that we ask the questions because there are income tests, there's certain rules depends but to find out what at what stage is it worthwhile but these are a game changer to keep you in the home bit of an overview i'm not going to go over this there's a bit of a process basically you get to choose the services depending on what you need almost no two people have got the same home care requirements and that's part of it 
there's some fees. I'll just be easier if I just provide it. And just more want to make you aware that this is the kind of stuff that does exist. Because most people will go through that graduation. When you start that in your early years, you'd probably be fine in a family home. It's more of a nuisance than anything else. Then you might get a low level form of home support at, at a, on a user pays basis, just subsidized. Then you might move on to home care. You might move through your packages from a two, a three, a four as you get up there. And that might, and what I find is that if you're receiving a level four in a retirement village, that might even completely prevent a move that's needed into aged care. Now, a lady asked a question about that. We'll see if we've got time for that in questions. But just to summarize, there's a whole bunch of opportunities for people over the age of 60 um, and 65 now to put money into super 60 if you've sold 65 ordinarily that previously weren't there. You may be entitled to a healthcare card. Um, it's huge. The, the thresholds have gone up significantly. And the other thing that we haven't really covered, I've glossed over, is that even if you've lost your pension, there might be a whole bunch of new tricks that have come in over the last few years that may actually get you your pension back. Something that we've done very successfully for a lot of people. And yes, the big one is more non-financial, is that you won't get a second chance at life. Like these are the prime years that I find. You've got the time, money, health, and the reason I think this is such a good option, and this is why I believe in it, why I'm t telling my family about it, is that it just facilitates you enjoying your life and looking at that as a lifestyle type of investment. And because that's the part that no money can compensate for. That's the way I see it. And in terms of future care options, that it's just thinking a step ahead. That for most people, that family home that was built in the 60s, 70s, that might be a two-story home, it, whatever, steps to come in. It probably doesn't have grab rails, walk-in showers, and a whole bunch of other things. It just comes standard in a retirement village. So, and, and potentially the aged care thing, which hopefully I'll cover off on in questions. But in a nutshell, what we do is basically take the stress out of this for people. There's so much going on here. We just translate it into plain English. If, you know, when you get these contracts, disclosures from that start time to the, I guess, all of the, what's going to happen with your super, Centrelink, all of this. Pretty much we just take the stress out of it and do that and help you get the most out of your care, your money, everything else. And just confidence that you've made the right choice, making an informed decision from a, it's an independent third party professional. That's all I've got. Questions? Yes. Uh, the, they'll be in the presentation that I share with you. Yeah, that I think I'll, I'll send that to Mary and then we can just distribute that way. But yeah, absolutely. Yes. How do you make your money? Yeah, I, I'm a fee-for-service financial planner. So if you come and see me, it just depends. Initially, if it's just a quick chat, I'll, I'm not even going to bother. I'll just put you on your way. Um, if it Usually we have our first appointment when it comes to retirement villages. I'll take you through the process and journey, answer all your questions. There's a cost associated. And one of two things happen at the end of that. If you, know, if you need further advice, I'll tell you what the costs are, or I prepare you to do it yourself. Just pretty simple, just, yeah. Yep. What about when you're over 74? Is there any way to put money into super? Yeah, downsize is basically the only way. Un unless you, look, there are, Unless you've got a business connection and a few other little tricks like that, but realistically, it's basically only downsizer for majority of people. Yep. Yeah, if you're downsizing, you said uh, each member of a super fund is about three hundred thousand. Yep. Is that over and above the cap? That yes. Is? Yep. Correct. It's over and above the cap, so this does not impact any of your other caps, and yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's considered an asset, absolutely. Yeah, there's no concession. That's where just one of the other questions, sorry, if I, if I tie together some of these questions just to go above a bit, is that if someone's over the age of 75, and let's just forget, let's assume downsize is not available, then we, we probably, super's not available. There are, just talking very broadly, 
due to the retirement income covenant, there's been a few other changes to how these, to the sorts of strategies that we'd put in place. So ideally, again, the same person who has, let's just say it's a couple. If they're under 74, I might do one set of strategies if they come to me at 76. They're, while super probably wouldn't be my go-to um, strategy, there are definitely others that we'd look at. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. How badly off financially would you be if you moved into a village but didn't like it? Well, normally, again, I, I'd, I'd get that's that's a good question. I'd I'd get you to look at the contract. So this is where retirement villages are a bit different. Where every single retirement village has its own contract and its own set of conditions that apply. Now, most what I find is they have a cooling off period, in some way, uh, like a try before you buy. Off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you what it is here, but if you, I'd probably, inc but there'll, there'll be a formula too. This is the other part that, and this is where someone like me comes in explaining all of this, where what you might find is there's this formula A plus B over C, where C is this and D is that, whatever. Then we can put a tangible answer because if you decide you don't like it after two months, it might be nothing, very minimal. Whereas if you don't like it after two years, it's a very different answer. And, but we can put numbers to all of this. The good part is, and that's part of what I do also, is just tell you, if you asked me that, if we were in our first meeting, I would have just, and if you told me prior to, because I, I ask people prior to meetings, how can I add value to your situation? What do you want answers to? And if you very specifically told me that, then I might tell you it will cost you X. If you move in after two months, refurb costs you within this period, two years, it'll cost you Y. And then you can make that decision accordingly or know when your deadlines are personally. Yeah. Uh, income stream. Yep. Over, is that considered as an asset or an income? Depends. Uh, it, no, no, it's considered both for the most part. And it, it depends on the type of income stream. If it's your standard account based pension super, then they do look at it as a deemed asset, but normally it's the asset test that, that will assess it for most people, but potentially both. Pretend, yeah, and, and it depends when it was, there's so many different layers to like anything financial. Was it a pre-2015 income stream? Then it's assessed one way, but for the most part, it is assessed as an asset and income, but it depends on the test you fall under. I might just, and, and on that, I might just one quick question uh, that, that I just took beforehand was, what if I need to go into aged care after a retirement village? So this is where, being Victorians, we have got some of the strongest, strongest rules. Now, this wasn't in place when I went through this with my grandparents, but now this is what makes things really, really good. If previously you had to wait for a retirement village to sell, and that can take up, to, you know, for some villages out there, there's a five-year period where if you don't have the money, then you're in trouble. Now, that's just not the case anymore. Because of our consumer laws, it, if you do move from a retirement village into a residential aged care facility, um, depending on when the contract was signed, basically there's a lot of these fees. You can actually get the retirement village. They have to pay it to the residential aged care facility to tide you over to make a lot of it a lot easier. And that has been just an absolute game changer. So it's been such a smooth transition. Now I look after New South Wales and Sydney too, like mostly digitally. Um, if I talk to someone in Sydney, I don't, I, I couldn't tell them that same thing. They don't have these same rules in New South Wales. Whereas for us, if someone was in the retirement village, you needed to go across the road to the aged care facility for argument's sake, then you wouldn't have the same financial pressure in any way we'd, well, it depends on your circumstances, but there's a set of rules that exist that make it a lot easier to make that transition. Yeah. That's the kind of thing we'd, we'd discuss. It depends on the, I mean, if someone saw me it later going into a retirement village, we'd just talk about that as a potential option so that should that time come, you might not need it, but at least you know what's available and just so you know your options. I think that's about the end of my time. I'm gone, gone a bit over, but yeah, unless there's any quick ones, it's, yeah. Perfect. 
So everything was general in advice. It was just factual, educational, and so none of this was personal. And I've left everyone feedback cards. Now, what I would really, really appreciate is if you could just leave some honest feedback, how you found it, and I genuinely want some um, just, well, criticism, whatever it is, just so I can make it better for next time. Really appreciate it. But thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me.